Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Eckert and I am coming to you from my canvas wall tent located on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia, Canada on the Tla'aman and Coast Salish Nation territories. And I am here on the Sunshine Coast as a conservation scientist and a PhD student studying human and black bear relationships, conflict towards coexistence. And as a scientist and as a human alive in this very bizarre year of 2021, I care deeply about science communication, about storytelling, and about building community. To that end, I am thrilled to be hosting the Hidden Compass YouTube series, Reimagined, as Hidden Compass's first brand ambassador. Nuanced and complicated and thoughtful and inclusive storytelling have perhaps never been more important. I am so immensely grateful to news organizations that pursue independent journalism, that dive into the complicated, messy, gray areas of life, uh, that rather than hot takes or, you know, uncomplicated clickbait, get into the thick of things. And, and Hidden Compass is doing just that, and I am so stoked to be on board. As a small part of this now beginning Hidden Compass journey and through the Reimagined series, I am going to be virtually sitting down with colleagues and friends who are, you know, awesome storytellers, who are scientists, artists, and much more. And I'm going to talk with them about words and ideas that, that shape us, that make us who we are as people and as a society reimagine some of those words, and also talk about the world we want to dream into being together. We will be broaching words like explore and discovery. We will be grappling with uh, colonial histories and the problematic present. We will consider new ways to tell stories, new ways to exist in this world so deeply in need of, of better ways to be. We'll entangle relationships between people and places and things and narratives, and we'll try to get to the root of things. And I want to invite you all along with us. But before we get into it and welcome our first guests for the first of many videos in this, this series, I want to make a few things really clear. And I'm going to start with that this series is not remotely going to attempt to provide like novel, comprehensive solutions to tricky, embedded global problems. I certainly cannot attempt to do those things. Nor is this series meant to represent all the perspectives that may exist in our world about a word, a reimagination, a reimagination uh, or subject matter. The perspective I and, and the guests that join me will share, will present, are very personal and individual in nature and won't represent, you know, our employers, our institutions, or any diverse group of human beings. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge my own positionality in the space and every space. Uh, I am a non-Indigenous white person of European descent, and I, for those reasons, have been the beneficiary of unearned and unjust privileges because of my race, one through things like violent colonization and racism. That privilege that we're all invited to reflect on, that should be a part of how we consider ourselves and our experiences in the world. And that positionality, which uh, I think academics and many others are called increasingly to assess in the spaces that they're in. My life experiences, you know, the unique things that color my perception of the world and that make me who I am, leave me with a really singular experience and perception of the world. So I want to be clear that this positionality is where I'm coming from as I approach this series and it's also where we can meet each other. Finally, I am hoping that this space can be one of, you know, lively discussion, even if online, that it can be one of positive disagreement and meaningful conversations, diverse thoughts, opinions, and human stories, much like the broader picture that is Hidden Compass, uh, and can also be an opportunity for community building in a time where I know community has become much more important to me than ever before in my life uh, throughout the last two years during the COVID times. And so I hope 
you'll join me in this virtual space and my super rad friends who are going to be generous with their time and sharing their thoughts and and colleagues on this journey from this place. Let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Reimagined, a Hidden Compass YouTube series. I am your host, Lauren Eckert, coming to you from my messy and kind of chilly wall tent on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia on Slaaman territory. And stoked to be joined today by Ryan Eagleson, a friend, a National Geographic explorer, a young explorer with the Explorers Club and a marine biologist. Do you prefer that as your, your scientist title, marine biologist, is that fit? Yeah, yeah marine biologist is good. Okay. <laughs> We're all, I feel like so many people on here, are comma careerists where they have like multiple disciplines and careers that they title themselves with, but we'll stick with marine biologist for now. You have a master's of science from the University of Guelph and you currently work for Parks Canada as a marine planner. And so we're thrilled to have you here today to tell us a little bit about what you do, talk about the term exploration in the context of, of your work with a number of different clubs and societies and as a human who works in the conservation and marine space. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for work, how you got to where you are in the marine biology space and, and how that aligns with your passions. Uh, yeah, so first, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so like you mentioned, I work for Parks Canada right now, specifically in the um, Protected Areas Establishment Branch, which establishes new national parks and new national marine conservation areas, which are the marine parks that um, Parks Canada specifically creates. And uh, sort of within that, I'm mostly focused, of course, on the those marine conservation areas, being a marine biologist, uh, I'm forced to help out with the land sometimes, which is devastating, of course. And uh, yeah, at Parks, I really started there as a student a few years ago. Um, if you're familiar with the FSWIP program, uh, the government has a federal student work experience program, I think. And uh, so I started there in their climate change division. Uh, so initially, our first projects were looking at all of Parks Canada's national parks and sort of creating climate models for each of them to help them prepare for conditions that they may face in the future. And uh, yeah, from there, I made sure to slink my way and get transferred to the marine section where I am today. And uh, yeah, and I've been here probably a year or two full time after my master's. Amazing. And so you've, you've done work with or funded by National Geographic in the past. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Uh, yeah, so initially, I had never even heard of the program or the that grants were even possible for a, you know, normal humans that are not famous uh, super photographers riding on planes anywhere. But uh, yeah, I had a roommate, you know, Justine Amadolia told me about the program and said I should apply. So, uh, and that sort of happened at the same time I started in a coral reef lab at, on campus in Guelph. Uh, so I sort of used that as a launching pad with my application and I applied to do uh, a reef project that sort of coupled with the work of my master's. Uh, so really the work was looking at, there's a species of Caribbean coral called the mustard hill coral. It's uh, not particularly exciting. It is pretty much an upside down <laughs> bowl that is <laughs> mustard yellow, as you may imagine. And, uh, I think it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's quite an important species in the Caribbean because it's really one of the only uh, hard coral species in the region that aren't in complete decline. They seem to be doing quite all right. Uh, so my work was on both the islands of Grenada and Bonaire, and we did a number of dive surveys, uh, you know, assessing their population status, uh, sort of what factors or, you know, say competition of their species or habitat type effects where they can be found. And as well, we assisted a lot uh, with the Nature Conservancy mapping the distribution of reef habitats and, you know, mangroves, eelgrasses, and, and things like that. Uh, so the National Geographic work really played into the Bonaire portion especially. Rad. Um, so for for those watching, Ryan and I met through a Young Explorer meetup with National Geographic. We we're both grantees uh, through National Geographic's Young Explorer program at around the same time. And using that title of Young Explorer, I'm going to transition on, on getting your thoughts on that term exploration. This is something 
Hidden Compass is is thinking a lot about as an organization sort of rewriting narratives or telling new stories in new ways. Uh, it's also something I've thought a lot about over the years as a National Geographic Explorer, what that means, how to be one of those in a good, you know, thoughtful way. And so I'm I'm wondering sort of broadly, and this can apply to the work you do in conservation and sort of it sounds like really future looking work in terms of climate change and how that plays into the marine planning ecosystems. Um, but what does exploration mean to you in your life and your work, however you want to answer that question? Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> it can be uh, also like a very, you can give us some insight into whether that's changed over time too. You can touch base sort of wherever you want to start. Uh, yeah, I certainly feel for myself it's it's changed quite a lot over time. Uh, I know certainly a little bit in my head, of course, you know, when I hear it, I think of sort of the, you know, top tier people you see on TV and volcanoes and, and things like that. But uh, I know certainly growing up, you know, it's the stereotype, like you mentioned, it's often quite dated. You know, they're male adventurers often, like the Savannah with the, <laughs> you know, the safari hat. Um, oh, yeah. And I know just for one uh, example, when we were in Washington for the uh, the sort of explorers meetup, I don't recall his name, but he uh, did his expedition to the Boiling River in the Amazon. Um, I remember I was just so excited by it because I seen the book in the store and I came to him and I was like, oh my gosh, like, did you like discover it? Like, because that's what I heard. And he was like, um, if you can discover a place that has thousands of people living in it. And I was just Andres Russo. Andres Russo. I'll put yeah. a hyperlink to him in the in the show notes because he's wonderful. But yeah, that's a great, a great point. <laughs> yeah, and that even I was just like, wow, I you know, in my head it meant was it Googleable before yeah. <laughs> before you totally. did this? Yeah. yeah, no, certainly now I find I've, you know, changed with everyone else and that explorer can be anyone exploring anywhere. And it really should focus on people, you know, living in the places where the, the work's being conducted. Uh, and focusing on building the capacity there because it's quite, I find especially uh, in the coral reef science field, it's uh, very predominantly, you know, North American, European, Australian scientists totally. flying all over the world to these places with reefs because it's nice to be warm. They like to explore cool, cool places yeah. when, you know, those places may be better served by people who live there all the time. Totally. An excellent point, especially in an era of reckoning with parachute science this idea that I think you and I have both come into contact a lot in uh, with in our work that in what is increasingly hopefully a bygone era, but we're not quite there yet, a model of science was often dropping in, parachuting in to places to do research and with sort of uh, exterior agendas and then leaving quickly. And I think that it's great to bring up the intersections between exploration or a certain type of exploration and and parachute science and I like the story of evolution over time I know coming from a really similar place as a little kid I my touch points for explorers were either like Ferdinand Magellan in like fourth grade social studies <laughs> yeah. or yeah like a, a white dude uh, in the plains of the savannah like putting down a flag <laughs> not not ideal representations of anything but colonization um so i really yeah i i feel deeply that transition too and it's cool that it, it i think it's a collective one it's a conversation that was certainly happening when we met up with a bunch of explorers at headquarters at national geographic and i think continues to grow um I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how in your forward looking, like, do you feel like an explorer in the context of looking forward at, say, climate change? Is that maybe a type of exploration you're doing now that doesn't require the same sort of like taking photos out of an airplane, but might require another newer type of exploration? Um. I would say personally, I don't really view it as such because it's, yeah. it's hard to in my my little cubicle here. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, certainly, I guess it is still a form. You know, we're often mapping, you know, upcoming marine protected areas. And it's so interesting to, um, you know, look into the future as to how these areas will change uh, and sort of, like I said, explore what they could be like. 
for instance, our one project is in the high Arctic. And one of the you know, main things we consider is to try to, you know, models can't tell us in this regard, but, um, you know, if the ice is summer free, or sorry, <laughs> the summer is ice free in the Arctic, say by 2050, uh, where will the marine mammals be? So we're trying really hard to try to find out the habitats or areas that they might move to. Um, so it's sort of like desktop exploring areas that don't exist yet. <laughs> yeah. Mapping new futures or doing your best to at least in a world that is rapidly changing. I find that super interesting. It's like from your desk, your time traveling in order to try and build marine reserves, protected areas that will work for yeah, the ecosystems that the future is bringing, which is like a kind of scary type of exploration, I imagine, <laughs> at times, or at least a heavy one. I hope the belugas out there uh, know that I'm on their I'm on their team. <laughs> God, me too. Oh, yeah. have you ever seen a beluga? Have you been to any of these areas? I've only seen belugas uh, in Tadoussac, Quebec. It's the southernmost population in the world, um, and I was only unwillingly seen brought. Belugas. <laughs> and I was unwillingly brought to Marine Land once as a seven-year-old <laughs> child. So <laughs> you did not consent to that. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm grateful for your transparency. <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah, I would love Lucas are on the list of things I would just love to see in the wild. Um. So okay. You talked a little bit about the transition you went through with the term exploration from this sort of like unbeknownst to you as a younger, like a child or as a younger person, a like colonial look at exploration. And you're thinking more and more about um, work that focuses on local communities rather than this idea of discovery that might be sold as discovery, but isn't rightly so is something that people have known about for a long time. And maybe this is a question that's hard to answer or that you have to answer by looking forward as well. In Canada, uh, uh, in the land now known as Canada, right? A country with uh, still grappling with its colonial history and modern policies that are only just catching up with the reality of indigenous rights. Do you see opportunities in the work of marine planning for doing less of that maybe extractive research and more of that community oriented research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I certainly don't want to, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of Parks Canada or the, the really? federal government, just as me. But uh, Just a question for Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certainly in a lot of the work uh, we do, it's really um, Indigenous communities come first. And uh, often many of our projects now, it's Indigenous groups have approached us to protect areas, not the other way around. Uh, and that's come to dominate almost all of our projects now. Uh, and Currently, say for instance, um, our zoning framework for protected areas, sometimes they can act to um, protect areas that say Inuit use for traditional harvesting uh, so that you know, tourists don't interfere or any other people visiting or as well protect cultural sites and things like that. And, uh, you know, or perhaps there's you know, always discussions about maybe like seasonal protected areas to protect uh, those marine mammals that are so important for their livelihoods. Uh, so really there's, right now a lot of change in the sort of protection and conservation field and really integrating that knowledge. Uh, yeah, if that, that's, <laughs> if that awesome. answers that's a great answer to the question. And like, I think it goes back to this idea of, um, I don't know if progression is the right word, but transition of, of understandings of things like research and conservation and exploration. It's hard to talk about one, like it's hard to talk about exploration without digging into how research and conservation are also changing and maybe not fast enough, but um, I mean, certainly in our time, I think since we like first met, a lot has changed in these fields in terms of uh, defining rights holders and stakeholders and looking for opportunities to bridge multiple knowledge types. And I think that hopefully we are transitioning away from these colonial mentalities of exploration as being singular to uh, if we can do exploration in a good way, it happening in these like communal collaborative equitable ways. So it's a great answer and great insight. Um, I wonder if you have, you talk a lot about modeling for the future, or you think a lot about modeling for the future in your job. I'm sure you also deal with some of the realities of forthcoming climate futures, which we all in conservation world deal with to some extent. 
<laughs> maybe we try and avoid it sometimes. If you could imagine a better future for marine species in Canada, or perhaps collective communities of Canada, what does that future look like? Um, one where hopefully we've completely defeated climate change and <laughs> greenhouse gases have returned to their pre-industrial levels. <laughs> but like, <laughs> that is uh, probably not going to happen <laughs> anytime mm -hmm. soon. But uh, I certainly view uh, the optimal feature as being one that, you know, say we've, I mean, it'll always be making progress, but reach some point where, you know, no more species are going extinct, no more being upgraded to endangered. You know, maybe many of them have backed away from moving towards extinction and that we've really returned the continent to a, you know, holistic, stable state that it was before colonization. Um, it'll likely be, you know, a less healthy state, but at least a, a stable one. So, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, this is a really hard question. I couldn't answer it if you asked me it right now, so don't try and turn it around. <laughs> I like being on this side of the, the desk. Um, <laughs> this question <laughs> is, so let's say you and I, as people dubbed explorers by a number of institutions that say fund research or conservation scientists, or conservation science, excuse me. What is our responsibility or how do we build towards that vision of a better world or at least a stable one? D example, this is not a comprehensive question. What are some examples of behavior that, you know, National Geographic explorers or people who care um, might do to contribute to that future coming? For me, it's really, even if they're very small, uh, they're successful projects that can say, even in a very small area, um, show demonstrable results to the public and get people excited to see what things, you know, used to be like or could be like. Uh, and I find that's the, for me, the most successful projects uh, in that field to uh, be able to do that. Amazing. That's so great. The little things like the work we can do on the ground, the Oh, maybe this is just me wanting to pat myself on the back and feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> but I think it's really easy just to echo what you've said, um, to get caught up in the massive scale of change that has to occur. And climate despair, environmental despair is like a very real feeling a lot of scientists and people alive on the planet right now have. And it's a privilege to be able to sm focus on small scale projects but also one that can result in like community level change that feels empowering and also makes a difference on the ground for species and for people. So I, I think that's a wonderful answer and I try and do the same. I might sometimes fall into despair, but, but it's short lived <laughs> when you have small scale projects that you care a lot about. So yeah, it's awesome. Anything else you want to share? We're, we're watching time, but do you have any final thoughts on exploration, on climate change, on marine species you care about? I'll open the floor. Hmm. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for all the questions. Uh, <laughs> you're a, a super good, uh, not an interrogator, but <laughs> <laughs> happy to chat. Uh, <laughs> I kind of like that. I might put that on my CV. <laughs> good interrogator. Um, yeah, in terms of exploration, uh, one thing kind of related to that just being how a lot of the you know what people classically think about it uh, is when the earth was in more of you know a wild state uh, is a sort of a concept I really like to tell people about all the time when I meet with them because I notice it often is uh, it's called shifting baseline syndrome mm -hmm. I'm sure you've encountered it for you as well but uh, you know just an example I'll see people at work all the time in the before times of course uh, will show me pictures of their, you know, crews, and they're like, oh my god, you won't believe the coral reef I saw. And it's like, I look at their photos, I'm like, this is not, <laughs> this is the dead yeah. skeletons of one covered with algae. And um, to then show them the pictures of like, this is what it's supposed to be. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You know, and so there's that disconnect there between what people realistically expect of, of the environment, because uh, they're not often there to explore all the time themselves. So. It's such an important thing to raise, given that human lifespans are so short and what we're exposed to, I, I try and avoid the word pristine, but like in terms of like a healthy functioning ecosystem, now our 
baseline for that is so much more degraded ecosystem than it would have been for people pre-colonization or even for our parents or their parents. Like things change so fast, but our, our collective memory is quite short. Um, <laughs> it's a great thing to raise. Like I did my master's in, on rockfish and, and I'm sure I have talked to you off about rockfish, but one problem there is shifting baselines where we forget how abundant they used to be and how big they used to be. And um yeah, it's a it's a nice thing to remind people to maybe interrogate um, our baselines. Like if you're looking for something to explore, do so internally in terms of your baseline relative to the truth of what a functioning ecosystem may have looked like before capitalism and colonization really <laughs> ramped up, you know, did their bad stuff. So I think that's a great, a great point to end on. Before we go, do you have any pluggables any like social media websites action items that you want to plug for our audience uh, i'm certainly not as uh professional in the social social media game as others uh i do have an open <laughs> are any uh, of us anymore i don't know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah, i mean my instagram is at regal so if anyone likes to see some occasional nature so, photos or good nature photos yeah, yeah thank you <laughs> yeah they're excellent my awesome. cell phone is uh is responsible, not not my talents. <laughs> hey, that's a pretty cool thing about being alive in the modern era. You don't need all the gear to tell cool, uh, cool stories via photos. Well, amazing, Ryan. Thank you so, so much for your time and for the work you do and for all the things. For everyone, you can find all the hyperlinks to our Hidden Compass stuff uh, below. And we will see you next week. And my dogs know that the interview is almost over and they're getting excited. <laughs>